The special delegates chosen to participate in the upcoming synod on synodality have been revealed, and Pope Francis has called a consistory to create 21 new cardinals in September. How will all of this shape the Catholic Church in the years to come? The Papal Posse, Father Gerald Murray and Robert Royal join us with analysis. The World Over begins right now. Now, Raymond Arroyo. A warm welcome to all of you joining us in the United States and the world over. If you'd like to comment on tonight's show, send me a tweet. I'm at Raymond Arroyo. Let's get right to it. Pope Francis made news on July 9th by announcing a consistory to create 21 new cardinals. The consistory is scheduled for September 30th, just prior to the start of the Synod on Synodality. The consistory will be Pope Francis's ninth and the 21 new cardinals, 18 of whom will be eligible to vote in the next papal conclave. Now, the Vatican's also published the names of delegates participating in this synod on synodality, including lay people who will, for the first time, be permitted to vote in a synod of bishops. How will all of this affect the shape of the Roman Catholic Church? Here with their reaction and analysis is the Papal Posse, editor-in-chief at thecatholicthing.org, Robert Royal, and canon lawyer and priest of the Archdiocese of New York, Father Gerald Murray. Gentlemen, uh, great to be with you once again. I had to bring you back because of all this breaking news and people, frankly, saying we need to hear from the posse. So here we are. Uh, gentlemen, as I mentioned, this will be Pope Francis's ninth consistory, which will bring the total number of cardinal electors to 137. Of that total, nine voting cardinals were created by St. John Paul II, 29 by Benedict XVI, and a whopping 99 will have been created by Pope Francis. Robert and Father Jerry, before we get to specifics, what are your thoughts on the sheer numbers involved here? And doesn't this essentially guarantee that Francis's agenda will carry through the next conclave? Bob. Yeah, it could. I wouldn't say so. You know, there, there's a long-standing uh, joke in Rome that people who go in as papabili, as, as electable as pope, come out as cardinals. I mean, and it's been verified many times. I mean, after all, the, the people who elected uh, Jorge Mario Bergoglio as pope were all appointees, basically, of John Paul II and Benedict XVI. I don't know mm. what to make about the the overall composition of these cardinals. I've looked at it as carefully as I can, especially the new ones. There are a couple that are, are in a kind of an ideological vein, like uh, Cardinal McElroy was in, in San Diego. But a large number of them, and of that 99 that you mentioned, uh, the, the growing part of the College of Cardinals overall has largely been, even under Francis, coming from Asia and from Africa. And those cardinals, it mm -hmm. seems to me, are generally not on board with kind of the, you know, progressivist ideology that some people fear is, is coming mm -hmm. down the line. So, look, it could guarantee kind of a continuity of regime the way that John Paul II led to Benedict. But on the other hand, there's this wild card that the peripheries are not like the developed world, and they may bring a very different perspective mm -hmm. to the next conclave. Father Jerry, anything to add? I mean, perhaps we should look deeper than the numbers. And when you do look at these men individually, particularly those from the far-flung peripheries, they are hardly in the model of Pope Francis. Yes, I agree with what Bob said. And I'd also note that, you know, as the Senate process has been uh, going on for the past year and a half, it's been tightly controlled by Rome. And I think that's a sign that they don't trust people on the peripheries to necessarily buy into the agenda from the start. So I would think at any conclave to come uh, when uh, Pope Francis is no longer the pope, uh, we're going to have a reexamination of the situation, comparing it with what was happening under the previous two popes. And uh, my hope and wish is that uh, the mission of the church will be highlighted, not the idea that somehow an administration, a pontificate an administration whose policies have to carry over to the next. You know, this we're talking about promoting the gospel and 
things have to be analyzed in light of that. Uh, the newly appointed prefect of the Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, Archbishop Victor Manuel Fernandez, is a cardinal designate. Now, Bob, Fernandez has once again expressed in a recent interview his openness to reconsidering the Church's prohibition on same-sex blessings, saying in a Spanish interview this week, quote, it wouldn't be bad to rethink it in light of everything that Francis has taught us. What do you make of that? Well, I, I think it's just silliness, frankly. Uh, we, we know from dogmatic teaching, and we know this from going back to St. Paul and Romans and many other elements in our tradition and in the Bible itself, that homosexual activity is a sin. It's simply a sin. Now, you know, all people commit sins, and, and we have to recognize that, and we need to be merciful and forgiving toward, toward sinners, but to bless some sort of relationship that is sinful in and of itself just makes no sense whatever. And, and I think that however much you want to invoke Francis's desire to be merciful and pastoral toward all sinners of various kinds, um, to me, this, especially coming from somebody who's now going to be the head of the doctrinal office in the Vatican, uh, this just seems to me to be very troubling and maybe a portent for some, some very large uh, problems to come down very soon in the future. Yeah. Father, the doctrinal office under Francis has already condemned the blessing of same-sex unions, but now Tucho Fernandez said in the same interview, quote, many say that it, the ban, does not have the flavor of Francis in the way it is drafted and in some of the expressions it uses. God does not and cannot bless sin. In this matter and in others, we will have to heed what the Pope asks of me at the end of his letter, which is for the dicastery's documents to embrace the recent magisterium. Now, Father, first off, why is the Church defying the doctrinal office, the normal magisterium, under Pope Francis? And must every doctrine now be subject to whether it has the smell of Francis? Well, this criteria is obviously not complete or adequate. Yes, we take into account uh, each pontificate's magisterium, its teaching. But this is not like the administration, uh, you know, in a political world where things change overnight once an election is held. So the doctrine of the faith, as Bob pointed out, is consistent and clear. Homosexual activity is intrinsically disordered, and homosexual inclination likewise is intrinsically disordered because it's leading people into actions which are, in and of themselves are offensive to God, apart from any intentionality on the, on the part of the people committing those sins. So the Pope himself signed a document in which it stated that homosexual blessings are not possible. And now Fernandez is telling us that the Pope doesn't mean that. Uh, we only take him at his word. That's his magisterium. Uh, this is causing confusion. And I have to say, this is playing into the hand that Father James Martin has been playing ever since he wrote that book, Building Bridges, because he says that the language of the catechism about intrinsic disorder is cruel and needs to be changed. And I have a feeling that this is going to be on the agenda at the Synod, and this is going to be a moment of crisis for the Church. The Church cannot teach that what is immoral can be blessed, and it certainly can't teach that what is disordered is somehow now simply differently ordered or a variation, but not really offensive to God. That's false. Yeah, and, and it looks like in a recent interview, Fernandez is even opening the door to changing that formulation in the Catechism, correct? That's correct. He gave an interview to Quotidiano Nazionale in Italy, as posted today on the, uh, or yesterday on the website, in which he said that, you know, the language of the catechism uh, hurts people and that Francis would certainly speak in a different way. Now, if he is signaling to us that there's some kind of movement to change the language of the catechism, this has to be vigorously opposed because it will only confirm people in sin and will give the impression that Catholic doctrine is subject to change. Catholic doctrine is not subject to change. The truth is the truth. It's handed down by God, it's witnessed in the scriptures, in the natural law, the constant teaching of the church. Uh, so we can't say that sodomy is good. And if that's what uh, Fernandez and others are trying to push the church toward, they must be resisted. Uh, Bob, there, there's a, there is an interesting thing at play here that you have Pope Francis's magisterium. This was Cardinal Ladaria under Pope Francis, who said one thing, you can't bless these unions. Now you have his successor, Fernandez, the new head of the doctrinal office, saying, 
wait, you might be able to bless these. This is very confusing within the one pontificate. I mean, to say nothing of one of the previous popes, is it every pope is just to be, all of his teachings are to be cast out depending on who holds the office? Well, we saw that 35 years of John Paul II and of Benedict XVI had been largely reversed in these 10 years of Francis's uh, papacy. Look, there, there was an interesting um, uh, lecture that was given at this outreach conference that Father James Martin uh, organized at Fordham University um, in the last few weeks, in which Juan Carlo Cruz, who was a victim of uh, sexual abuse and is a homosexual, claimed in a public lecture that the Holy Father told him that that document from the CDF, the then the CDF, um, that said that homosexual unions could not be blessed, that he read it but did not sign it, and he was pained by it. And Juan Carlo Cruz even says it was fanatics, that was his word, fanatics inside the Vatican who were blocking the idea of, of uh, blessings of homosexual unions. Look, this, I, I don't know what they're about here because they, they are themselves confused and confusing. But given the, the, the impression that, yes, we can kind of be nicer to people, okay, that there's nothing wrong with that, but that somehow this also kind of almost half implies that maybe Someday down the line, it'll be po possible to reverse this teaching. That simply is not true. And if that happens, we are in open uh, heresy and open schism from the past of the church. Um, I hope that this confusion does not persist over years now with, with uh, Archbishop Fernandez in the, in the DDF. But I greatly fear that that's where we're headed. Hmm. Father, um, as long as we're talking about Archbishop Fernandez, the new doctrinal officer of the Vatican, he admitted to the Associated Press that he, quote, made mistakes in his handling of a 2019 case of a priest accused of abusing minors. Now, Fernandez has been accused of protecting the priest, but has denied that until now. He says that if it were today, he would have acted very differently and that his performance was insufficient in this matter. Again, this is the man who will ultimately be in charge of protecting doctrine and, and, and prosecuting these abuse cases in the church. Father Jerry, what do we know about this case and why would Fernandez not be subject to Pope Francis's own strict law that calls for the immediate removal of officials who cover up or don't deal properly with sexual abusers? Well, I'm glad that he admitted that he didn't do what he would do now in the past. But, you know, this reminds me of uh, damage control, partial hangout, uh, admitting things. Um, no, he, if it's true, as he's now he says he didn't do things right, what didn't he do right? He should give a full accounting of how he handled the case, the reasons he did some things, because the victims in this case uh, are quite vehement and they claim that he protected the priest. That priest, by the way, committed suicide on the day he found out that he was going to be arrested, which is uh, can be interpreted very easily as an admission of guilt. But no matter what, uh, Archbishop Fernandez was in charge of the diocese at that time. And now if he says he did something wrong, let's get the details. And let's see if the victims feel satisfied with what he says. I'm sure we have not heard the end of this story. Bob, where is true justice, or is it only applied selectively? I, I, I thought the Vatican had a zero-tolerance policy toward clerics who covered up or didn't properly deal with sexual abusers. Well, look, we, we've seen lots of inconsistencies in this papacy as a whole, and I guess it, and to a certain degree it affects all papacies because the Church is such a big and complex uh, institution. But, you know, I have to say that globally, one of the things I find very disturbing about the appointment of Archbishop Fernandez, and of course the Pope has a right to appoint whoever he wants, and even if there are, there are problems in the past, but one of my, my main concerns here is that the person who you could hope would be a kind of a sign of unity. The Pope is, is, is a, the bridge builder, the pontifex. But the people he, he assigns to these very high offices should also be people that we can trust to bring us together on these disciplinary matters and on doctrinal matters. 
And I think that what we're seeing instead is that, th that we're exacerbating the situation on both ends of that. And one of the reasons why we have law, I'm not a canon lawyer, and Father Murray, of course, will want to comment on this, but the reason we want to have law is because we don't want favoritism or we don't want the, the persecution mm -hmm. of people um, unjustly. We, we want to use the law to give us a sense of what is just in given circumstances. And if we're going to have, have a law that bishops who have covered up should, um, if, if not, if not uh, be removed or, or blocked from further offices, at least explain themselves, well, then we ought to adhere to yeah. that, or we should just declare that we don't care about what canon law or the, the disciplinary law of the church is. Well, and, and Father, you can't have an exemption if you're a friend of Francis. I mean, you know, I'm thinking of Cardinal Maradiaga, who is also going to be attending this synod, by the way. And this is a guy who his right hand man, his auxiliary vicar, w was accused of all kinds of sexual malfeasance. And it just gets brushed away. And then we have the famous case of Father Rupnik, uh, who very yeah. re a reliable uh, evidence against him, the direct testimony from victims uh, that he was committing grave, grievous sexual acts against nuns. And yet he is uh, he was never punished for that. He, he was excommunicated, but it was lifted very, almost instantaneously. And it was never known that he was excommunicated until it came out in, in the uh, revelation on the media. So. We do have a standard of justice, uh, you know, that is has not been applied evenly. Uh, Vos Estes was the document that the Pope issued, was designed to get, uh, guarantee greater tra uh, transparency and also regularity of law so that bishops would be held accountable for the crimes that they uh, covered up, just as the criminal priest would be held accountable. But it hasn't been applied uh, over the worldwide scene with any kind of consistency. And uh, the Fernandez yeah. case would be very interesting to see, you know, as I said earlier, what yeah. do the victims think about this apology? I, I think we have to hear from them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to get to some of the other new cardinals just named. Archbishop Christophe Pierre, the apostolic nuncio to the U.S., has been elevated to the um, College of Cardinals. Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, uh, Pierre Battista Pizzaballa, also Father Jerry, what do these two men bring to the College of Cardinals? Why do you think they were elevated? Well, I think in the case of Archbishop Pierre, he's been a very loyal uh, nuncio to Pope Francis because a uh, number of his speeches to the uh, Bishops' Conference annual meetings, uh, he's more or less insisted the American bishops that they have to adopt the style of, of Francis as, as it's you know popularly known. Uh, he's uh, been very faithful in that. In fact, He's beyond retirement age. He's 78. Nuncio's retired at 75. So Pope Francis has mm -hmm. left him in his position uh, longer than the usual five-year term. Uh, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, I I'm very happy that he was named because, of course, uh, the mission of the Catholic Church to Catholic faithful and to all the people in the Holy Land is of great importance. And being a cardinal gives him yeah. greater prestige. Uh, so I think that was an excellent nomination. Yeah. Bob, I want to get your reaction to these other appointees. Bishop Stephen Chow of Hong Kong. Now, he's a Jesuit, a successor of Joseph Cardinal Zen, the heroic cardinal who's been on, on this program many times. Uh, Bishop Chow has just been named a cardinal. Now, he's an advocate of the ordination of women. He favors cooperation with the CCP, with the Communist Party. How does this advance the faith of the Chinese and what's the message here, do you think? Well, I think the message is it's more of the same. Um, we, you know, we've said many times on this show that we, we can see what the Chinese got from this, what we still call the secret agreement with the Vatican, because we don't know mm -hmm. what is in it. Uh, we know what the Chinese got, but we don't know what the church got out of this. And it, it, it just seems that there's a, a willingness to extend an infinite uh, length of patience for the Chinese to show some sort of respect back toward the church. I think that um, his appointment in Hong Kong was itself already uh, problematic. I, I think that Cardinal Zen, I don't remember this exactly, but I think he was upset that, that Chow was appointed there. And to raise him to a, a cardinalship with the baggage that you, you talk about, and especially his closeness to this communist regime, which has been nasty not only to Catholics, but to, to Muslims and to, to Protestants. Yeah. Um, in my view, th this just communicates to the Chinese that they have nothing to fear from the Vatican. But 
Well, I guess we'll have to stay tuned and hope that something changes along the way. Father, uh, also among the new cardinals is Auxiliary Bishop of Lisbon, Americo Aguilar. Now, he recently said that, and he's running World Youth Day, by the way, which is happening this summer. He said about the goal of World Youth Day, quote, we don't want to convert the young people to Christ or the Catholic Church or anything like that at all. We want that a Catholic or Muslim or Jew or a non-believer can say that he is what he is and be okay. The difference is good, and the world will be better with it. He later clarified these words, saying World Youth Day is an invitation to all the young people of the world to experience God. Father, I, I, I have seen apologists say that this is consistent with Benedict XVI's rules for interreligious dialogue, but is World Youth Day a youthful interreligious dialogue? Uh, no, it's supposed to be a gathering of Catholics to uh, inspire them in the faith. You know, the whole purpose of World Youth Days was to ensure that the younger generations would not drift away from the church. So, you know, I was shocked, just as everyone else was, that a Catholic bishop, soon to be cardinal, would say that uh, we, World Youth Day is not about bringing people to Christ and the church. Well, then why are we spending all the money in having it? You know, this is we don't we don't believe in youth jamborees where we all take a pledge to love each other and be nice to each other. That's all good, but let the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts do that. But the purpose yeah, of the Catholic Church is the that. salvation of souls. I mean, where in the world do we hear bishops talking about salvation of souls, you know, engaging in the heroic struggle against temptation and the devil, uh, and then living the, the glory uh, of the sacramental life following the preaching of Christ? You know, World Youth Day always concludes with a papal mass, which is beautiful. It centers on Christ. So to tell us that I'm not interested, the World Youth Day is not about bringing people to Christ in the church. Uh, this is shocking. This, this should never have been said. I, I regret that he did it. I'm, no. And his apology was only partial. Again, it was we're not into, right. into proselytism. It this isn't proselytism to invite people to go to confession and adore Christ in the Eucharist. And here's some talks about Catholic doctrine. Yeah, I, I have to say, Bob, I read this and I thought, well, hold on. You represent the Church of Jesus Christ, presumably, and you're a link to the apostles. Now, is that true or false? Because if it's true, then you have an obligation to go and promote your brand, right? You want to promote the gospel of said Jesus Christ. But there's a lot of confusion. I mean, th this looks like a global citizens concert, which, frankly, you get bigger stars and better uh, music. So why would you go to the World Youth Day? I'll let you respond. Yeah. Uh, look, we, we, uh, the Catholic thing appears in several languages, and one of them is Portuguese. And our Portuguese translator knows this bishop in particular, and he's written about him recently. And he said that he's actually not that bad a guy. So in one way, the story is that this guy who's not so bad says this thing that our translator says is, was ill-advised, to say the, the very least. But I think the, the larger lesson or the larger story here is this man would never have said this unless that there had already been created this, this sort of sense of a synodal church where everybody who wants to walk with us is, is welcome to walk with us, except we don't know where we're all walking to. And the fact that you start to bring in people who aren't exactly on the Catholic path that's been defined over, over centuries and millennia, um, if you really are inviting those people and you're going to obviously lose the, the direction that you're, you're intended. So to me, I think that it was a, a combination of a man who spoke uh, carelessly and, and ill-advisedly, but also because under any other pope, he would never have said this. And, and Francis has induced yeah. this confusion and actually encouraged people to talk in those terms. Yeah, I, I have to say, uh, I have a simple question. Do you have the truth? If you do, give it to young people and everybody else. If you don't, then just don't have anything. Stay home. Lock, close the doors. You become the museum church you often talk about. Uh, I want to move on to the announcement of the names of those invited to be special delegates of the Synod of Bishops in October. Now, the Vatican released their list on July 8th. The delegates are chosen by bishops' conferences, the Eastern Rites, curial leaders, plus 120 personally selected by Pope Francis. Now, in all, that's 363 people who will be, who will be allowed to vote in the Synod. Fifty-four of those are women. 
Now, in addition to the voting members, there'll be 75 experts invited to the assembly to share their input. Uh, th these are a few of those cleric delegates personally chosen by Pope Francis to vote at the Senate. They include Bishop Stephen Chow uh, of, of Hong Kong, China, Cardinal Blaise Supich, Archbishop of Chicago, Cardinal Wilton Gregory of Washington, D.C., Cardinal Robert Walter McElroy of uh, San Diego, Cardinal Gerhard Mueller, the Prefect Emeritus of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, Cardinal Sean O'Malley uh, of Boston, Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez Maradiaga, and Father James Martin. Bob, what do those names indicate about the direction and vision of this synod? Cardinal O'Malley, Cardinal Mueller are in the mix as well. But uh, two of these things are clearly not like the others. Well, I think we know that Mueller is sort of a, you know, he's a token representative, and because he's mm -hmm. been pretty much shut out of the Vatican ever since he left the uh, Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Look, the, the interesting thing here is look at what our American bishops did. They, they had the right to nominate certain delegates to send to, to Rome for the, the synod, and they universally uh, nominated very solid, you know, kind of moderate bishops. It's Cardinal Dolan, uh, Kevin Rhodes from Notre Dame, Bishop Barron uh, from Minnesota, um, mm -hmm. uh, Bishop Flores from Texas, you know, these, and, and uh, Archbishop Broglio, who's the president of the Bishops' Conference right now. So these are right. five men who are, you know, very good, solid churchmen. You may disagree with them about one thing or another, but they're, they're sort of moderates and, and we'll, we'll have a, an interesting conversation. The other five that you just mentioned, uh, Sean O'Malley accepted perhaps, are very ideological. And it's, it's clear that, on the one hand, we've got the, the locals who know what we need here in the church in the United States presenting one vi vision, and then another vision being selected by Rome. And some of the lay people selected by Rome, like Father Martin and also a, a woman from Minnesota, I think are pretty much on the fringes of what Catholicism is in this day and in, in the past. So we've got these, mm -hmm. this tension of these two different visions, and we know at least where we where we think that the Holy Father and his staff are, are overweighting the, uh, the people that he's allowed to choose uh, of his own free but, will. Uh, yeah, but you see, but this is my whole point. You can't say it would be like me saying, you know, I want to hear everybody's voice, Bob. I want you to bring everybody you can. I'm going to listen to everyone and let them listen to me. We're going to have a great big listening session and share our truths, what the Spirit is calling us to. Oh, wait, Bob, here's the list of the people that you are allowed to bring in. I mean, that's not really truth in advertising. I'm sorry. This is an invited guest list of elites. That's what this is. Father Jerry, we spent a good deal of time talking about many of these men over the years. Uh, these are just a few of the bigger names. Your thoughts on where the Pope's mind is in these choices? Sure. Well, it's obvious that uh, people propose doctrinal change, pastoral change to favor uh, tolerance of sin in the life of the church. They're getting favored. Father James Martin is uh, probably the most shocking appointment, but I shouldn't be shocked because the Pope has favored him up to this point. But um, his main contribution to the life of the church is the attempt to say that homosexuality is a condition created by God. God is pleased that people are homosexual, and uh, he would like the church to soften up on its approach. Um, now, what does that mean? It, in the end, it means changing the doctrine. Uh, Cardinal McElroy is in the same school of thought. Uh, Cardinal Supic is in the same school of thought. Uh, so what we have here, and it's very sad to say, I said this about a year and a half ago, the synod on synodality is turning into the synod on homosexuality. Now, what, what are we talking about here? The Catholic Church has a liberating truth about human sexuality, which is life-giving, and it does not include approving mortal sin. But that's what these pressure groups and then people who support them in the hierarchy and priests like Father Martin uh, it's it very, very sad. The German bishops are in a similar condition. Bishop Batzing is going to be at the Synod. Uh, he's a proponent, again, of homosexual blessings and change in doctrine. Uh, Cardinal Hollerick, Cardinal Mark. It, it's hard to believe, Raymond, that here we are talking about the most vital issue in the life of the Church is to declare that we've been mistaken for 2,000 years about a teaching that is biblical and clear that sodomy is a sin and should not ever be approved by the church. But that's what's going on now. With same-sex unions, or blessings rather, seemingly high on the agenda, the synod nominations do seem to reflect 
uh, some of the thinking you've been talking about. More than one of the delegates named uh, are openly pro-same-sex blessing. Cynthia Bailey Manns, a Catholic activist and member of St. Joan of Arc Catholic Community in Minnesota, not parish, is a promoter of adoption by same-sex couples. Sister Vizquia Valladares, a Nicaraguan nun living in Spain, also promotes the blessing of same-sex unions within the church. Bob, is the deck stacked on this issue at the Synod? Well, it is. But then again, as I keep saying, the, the delegates from the peripheries may make a big difference. The, the, the thing that I find most striking about this is, look, we, th we are three Americans. We know the American church rather well. How in the world do they find that this, this, uh, this person from this St. Joan of Arc community in Minnesota, there's got to be a network in Rome or a network via someone like Father James Martin that picks an extremely obscure and extremely radical person. The same with this Nicaraguan nun who ends up in Spain. And, and I think this reflects that there was a much deeper, much broader coalition in Rome other than simply Francis himself that, that seems to be, be, be preparing the sea change in, in Catholic teaching. And I, I think not only on this, I think we're going to see other things that are going to be pressed. Maybe we're going to go back to the, you know, the unicorn of, of, of women deaconesses and married priests. Again, that seems also to be, I mean, these are all secular things that have been around for 60 or 70 years. And yet they, they seem never to, to go away, even though they've been dogmatically defined over and over and over again. Father Jerry, uh, how can these discussions go forward canonically? I mean, w we talk nearly every week about settled doctrine that, at least in the Francis era, seems rather unsettled. And with Fernandez in charge of the doctrinal office and now this lineup at the Synod, uh, I mean, is everything up for grabs here? Well, the mere fact that lay people are going to vote at the Synod means it's no longer the Synod of Bishops, because by definition, a Synod of Bishops is made up of bishops. And there was an exception for a few priests, but that has to do with the sacrament of holy orders, which priests and bishops share. So now with lay people there, this is the synod of bishops and non-bishops. Essentially, it's functioning as a political gathering. Uh, the selection basis included a 50 percent representation among the non-bishop candidates that were nominated by the different continental assemblies. They had to be 50 percent women. Now, th that's like the European Union. I mean, th this is... This has nothing to do with how the church functions. If the only people who knew stuff about specific topics were women, then they should all be women. And likewise, if all men. Uh, the idea that somehow you appoint someone because they were in the process, that was another criteria. You had to be part of the process from the beginning. So if I went to a meeting a year and a half ago, suddenly I'm a candidate to be sitting next to the, the cardinal prefect of the doctrine of the faith and my vote equals his. I mean, this is absurd. Canonically, this is all wrong. It shouldn't be happening this way. It's not historically justified. It's not theologically justified. Are we questioning, you know, they talk all the time now about we have to find positions of power for women in the church, power meaning decision-making properties. Well, what that concerns is the nature of the Episcopal authority in the church, which by divine commission is given only to the bishops. It's not given to other people. So, this is a big, big mess, uh, very discouraging because, you know, stacking the deck with who's there, but then just creating an institution that has no history, no relevance according to Catholic doctrine. If you want to have a synod of lay people, go ahead and have one. Listen to them, but don't pretend that they are, exercise the same authority as bishops in the life of the church because they don't. Yeah. No, well, there, there's a twofold thing. I mean, you, you, you nailed it when you said this is, this is a political veneer to it. But... My take on it, when I first heard that they were introducing all of these lay people, when it's only bishops, there's some discretion. And the bishop understands the weight of his words, and internal conversations are kept in that internal forum. When you have lay people running around, listening and taking notes, you now have a vanguard of media operatives that you can send out to pepper the media around the world with this controversy or that, this leak or that. And 
uh, lean into issues that you want to have more attention and demonize positions or individuals who you don't want to hear from. That's what this is designed to do. And mark my words, that's what we'll see much more of. I think, I fear, Cardinal Mueller was right. This is a hostile takeover of the Catholic Church with a freestanding institution that has never ha happened in the history of Catholicism. Never occurred. Bob, papal biographer uh, and occasional attack dog Austin Ivory has been named as a synodal expert facilitator. I guess Father Jerry and your invitations must have gotten lost in the mail. Uh, given the speed of, of which all of this is happening, what does this tell us about the Pope's mindset at this moment? And does the haste tell us anything about the condition of his health and the way he sees it? Yeah, there's been a lot of speculation about um, the, the appointments to the Synod and the large number of new cardinals that are being made, that, that this may reflect a, a Pope in a hurry, knowing that his health is not good, he's 86 years old. And, and there, there may be an attempt, as Archbishop Fernandez says, to, you know, to make sure that the changes that the Pope has introduced are, are permanent. They're irreversible, is a term that he's used. Well, I, I said earlier, and I want to repeat again, that we know that the 35 years of John Paul II and Benedict XVI have been eminently reversible, and the things that, that uh, can be reversed if a new Pope comes in or a new uh, spirit kind of enters into Rome, I, I think everything can change again. My worry about all this is not is about the specifics, of course, that like homosexuality, women priests, etc. But it's also this that people in the modern world feel themselves carried away by this tide, this uncontrollable tide of change, what some people have called liquid modernity, that there's nothing to hold on to. Mm. The tradition used to be something that used to, to stabilize us. All this is giving the impression, if not to, to the most faithful Catholics, but people in general in the world, that the Catholic Church, like everybody else, can change depending on who happens to be uh, in the uh, apostolic palace at a given time. That's not Catholicism. Catholicism is a dynamic tradition, which means it adapts to each period that it's in, but it remains faithful to its, its tradition and also, most importantly, faithful to the teachings of Jesus. And I think once we lose that fidelity and that stability, we're even leading people into more d uh, troubled waters than they've been in up till now. Father Jerry, talk about that impermanence. I mean, the church was always the rock. I mean, that's what it's created to be and upon, the rock in the world, the unmovable, uh, absolute, eternal teaching and perspective of Christ in that world. You have the last word. Yes, no, and this is actually one of the, the probably the most crucial issue that is going to be uh, in, the, in, in the forefront is the binding force or binding nature of divine revelation. Does divine revelation have a binding force, meaning what was taught by Christ and has always been taught by the church, can that change? And the answer, of course, is no, because God is truth. The truth of God revealed is for our salvation. Uh, we have an apprehension of the truth with an accurate understanding of it, thanks to Christ. And his, he said to the apostles, he who hears you hears me. Uh, that authority was then transmitted to the bishops. And the Pope is the safeguard, uh, safeguard of orthodoxy in the Church. Uh, he was given the command to strengthen the brethren. So, as Bob said, liquid modernity is really the assault that's been going on ever since the Enlightenment on the whole nature or notion that you can have something that's permanent and true and unchangeable. And the whole va a wave of, of, of pre-synodal actions and now these latest appointments, they point to a group of people who don't believe that. They do not consider revelation to be binding. Rather, it can be changed. They'll call it, uh, they always do, they'll call it a development. We're going to develop the teaching. Well, development does not mean denying. And if you change a teaching, something is good and makes say now it's bad and vice versa, that's, that's betraying revelation. And then really, what's the center of the whole Catholic Church? It is Christ. We are all servants of the Lord, and his word gives life to us. The Father revealed his word through the Son, and then the Holy Spirit guarantees that the Church will teach that word. So people come along and try to change it. They're really unfaithful shepherds, and now lay people are agitators who are working with them. Uh, we have to pray. We have to pray that this sin does not devolve into this, because, quite frankly, you can't cut a deal where everyone's going to be satisfied. Either you teach the teaching of the Church and the radicals go home sorry, or you say, no, the door's open to change, and then we realize, my goodness, 
we are in a serious, serious problem here. We cannot give in to these forces of radicalism. Mm. Well, one thing I know for certain, there'll be a lot of people covering this synod. We are going to be ground zero, must-see TV throughout this synodal process because uh, others, I think, are looking to shave the edge off or try to, you know, hide this or that. We don't do that here. Uh, we're, we're here to tell you the truth, as what Mother Angelica wanted. We've been trying to do that for so many decades, and I'm thankful you all are here for the ride. So, gentlemen, thank you so much. Uh, for commentary by Robert Royal and Father Gerald Murray, visit thecatholicthing.org. Thank you both. See you soon. My next guest is an actress, a wife, and mother of three. She's a former Miss USA winner and is now a successful businesswoman, focusing on women's health and wellness. She's the founder of the lifestyle platform Reshape and the author of a brand new book, Reshape Your Life. Don't settle because you are worth it. I sat down with her earlier this week to talk about it. Here's my exclusive interview with Allie Landry. Allie, thanks for being here. Uh, before we get to the book, I have to start. Uh, you're a fellow Louisianian um, uh, at the other L.A. Uh, now, I grew up in New Orleans, <laughs> but you grew up in Cajun country. Tell me about how that shaped the woman you've become. Your dad worked in the oil fields. I know your mom he did. was your first inspiration, a bit of an entrepreneur. Yes. You know, well, first of all, you know, I, I have such a connection to my roots. I have a beautiful, large Catholic family. There's 10 children on my dad's side, eight on my mom's side. Everybody lives on two big patches of land. I call it one-stop shopping. I just park the car, one, one, one home, and then I just go house to house to visit everyone. And opening the book, I mean, honestly, the first two chapters is truly a love letter to Louisiana to the, com I get, I get emotional, to the community that raised me, to all the strong women that I had around me. Um, and I think I appreciate it even more now that I'm away from it all. So to this yeah. day, I honestly still consider myself, you know, just a small town girl. Hmm. What, what role did your Catholic faith play uh, in your life when you were growing up? I know it is such a, you know, uh, for, for Louisianians, it's such a part of our lived and daily existence and communal life. It really is. It's a part. I'll tell you this. I feel like everybody in our area in southwest Louisiana is Catholic. So I honestly think that it was something I took for granted. And, hmm. you know, of course, there was went to church every Sunday and I went to a Catholic school and was taught by nuns. And I had, you know, my faith as that foundation. But it was not until I was an adult that I really evaluated my life and recommitted mm -hmm. to my faith in the most profound way. Mm -hmm. And I'm really, um, God, when I did that, God showed up in my life um, in a completely different way and really walked alongside me in the journey. Ali, the new book, uh, Reshape Your Life, it's really all about transformation. Uh, now, you've it had is. so much success in your life, uh, Miss USA, your acting, uh, but you've also experienced loss and tragedy. And you write in the book, when life turns upside down, you can feel dizzy and off balance, like you're falling. What I found is that it helps to tether yourself to what you know to be true in your core. For me, that's my faith. I began to pray like never before, only God could comfort me and give me the peace and healing I so desired and transform, and transform my heart. God was present for yeah. me. It has been the only time yeah. in my life when I heard God's voice so clearly, and I think it is because I was so fully dependent on him. Tell us about that time and how important it is in life to be tethered to truth. You know, really the book is all about reshapes, right? I feel for me, I never want to see a woman settle for less than what she deserves, right? And the book really helps you identify areas in your life that just are not serving you. And I share with you the tools to help you get to the other side and really create those true and lasting reshapes. But at the core of it all, at the core of it all, honestly, is my faith. And it's when, you know, there were times, there have been many reshapes, but, you know, I've had some around betrayal um, and love, right? Mm -hmm. And tragedy and loss where they brought me to my knees and I did not have the answers. 
and I honestly had to completely surrender, surrender my own will. Like I couldn't do life the way I wanted to do it. I had to, because I felt so helpless in those moments that I had to mm. give it, I had to honestly give it to God. And when I did that, that's when I heard, I was in so much pain, right? But that's when I heard his voice so clearly. And that's when the transformation started to happen within myself. I was able to sit mm. in that quiet, sit in that pain and just let, and like, I was like, God, listen, I've made many mistakes in my life. I can't make any more. Or I, I have to be able to move through this with happiness and joy and positivity. I can't have resentment. I can't feel anger. Like I want the best life for myself, but your plan is way bigger than mine. So just take, hold my hand and take me through. And I get chills because mm. You know, I don't get an opportunity to speak about that very often. And so I do it in the book and I'm so happy we get to talk about this here because that is yeah. where it was my relationship with God and, and my faith that really brought yeah. me through the toughest times. If I didn't have that, I don't know if I could have got through, I would say, in the miraculous yeah. way that I did. Ali, you also talk about forgiveness and uh, not only yeah. forgiveness for others, but forgiving ourselves for past mistakes. What would you say to those struggling with their past and the things that they've or choices they've made in their past? You know, I look at I even look at my own life and I think, you know, I definitely went to the wayside. I've definitely made bad choices. I've definitely made mistakes. But I have to stay, say now, standing where I'm standing, I, it's, mm -hmm. I, I embrace those times and I look at them as part of the fabric of my life. It was wonderful learning experiences because I allowed them to be. Um, mm -hmm. And I think forgiveness is so important. I had a really hard understanding, time understanding what that was, especially when someone betrayed me and I had to learn to move forward with forgiveness. I honestly thought that forgiving would mean that I'm saying like, that's okay what you did to me. Like I'm, I'm good with that, but mm -hmm. that's not what it was. Forgiving, forgiving that person allowed me to move forward, right? It allowed me not to carry anything forward in my life because they weren't worrying about it. Um, and mm -hmm. I, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It actually took me a while to like figure it out and, and for that concept to land on me. Um, but again, like I really try to walk the reader through as best I can through my personal experiences and give them those tools of how to kind of maneuver through these situations in their own lives. The book, it deals really with the health of the mind, the body, the heart and the soul. Uh, after years yeah. of working in Hollywood, acting and, and, you know, landing your dream job of a talk show host, your health and wellness took a sharp downturn. What happened? Yeah. And, and how did you come upon this idea of reshape? Yeah, that's honestly where it all started, like the concept of reshape. I was on, you know, a daily talk show. I was on Fox. It was a panel. I was, you know, so excited. Uh, but that kind of schedule was really tough. You know, it's up at five, live at nine. Uh, I thought by the time I got off at 10, I was going to get in some exercise. I was going to go to the grocery store, cook this dinner, pick up the kit, you know, have this whole great day. In reality, yeah. I would get home exhausted. I would climb back into bed. I, the best way I could describe it, and I think women, I was in my mid forties at the time. I felt off. I felt sick maybe, but not sick enough to go to the doctor, right? Just didn't feel myself. Mm. And so I actually went to a naturopathic doctor and did my first full blood panel. And I had so many aha moments and really saw where I was off. I was experiencing, you know, poor digestion, poor sleep, chronic pain issues, um, mm. mild depression. I mean, low energy. I felt like I was living half a life. And once I started mm. making some adjustments with the guidance of the naturopathic doctor and many others that came into place after that, I experienced that next level of health, but I was about to throw in the mm. towel. You know, my girlfriends, when I asked them, they're like, yeah, Allie, like we're getting older. That's what happens. And for me, that just didn't sit well. I was like, I'm 40 something years young. Like I have this great life in front of me. I want it to be vibrant and amazing and I want more. And so I just dug mm. in and did the work. And uh, that's part of that, what I share, you know, because I know it's possible. Yeah.
Yeah. You, you've spoken and written about your 17 year marriage to uh, film director Alejandro Monteverde. Of course, people will be very familiar with his work, Little Boy and, and Bella and so many other great films. Uh, you have three children together. Tell me about the importance of that relationship, how it changed your life. You know, I was coming off of a betrayal that we spoke about earlier, and that's when I mm -hmm. completely surrendered my my life, my relationship mostly to God. I was just like, I've made bad choices. I, I, I was very specific about what I wanted in a partner. Very, very specific. One of them was I wanted them to be equally yoked. I prayed for him in great detail. At the time I was doing, uh, mm -hmm. reading Purpose Driven Life uh, by Rick Warren and mm -hmm. I was doing the workbook and that was like such therapy for me. And we met at a theology class. Alejandro and I met at a, at a theology class. Hmm. We actually, um, I, I honestly felt we were both writing in a diary at the same time. And I, I truly feel with everything in my heart that God delivered him to me. He delivered this man to me. And we do not have a perfect marriage by all means. I don't want people to think that. But at the end of the day, hmm. you know, he is the leader of our family. He keeps us so close to God and reminds us like daily gratitude, appreciation, like always looking to him um, mm -hmm. for all of our blessings, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I, I just have utmost respect for him, even with his projects that he's doing. Mm -hmm. Like you mentioned, he has a new one that's coming out. We're actually going to Rome to show it to the Pope, which I'm so excited on Sunday. Um, and just the projects he puts out in the world are so hopeful and so beautiful and just raises humanity. Um, I mean, it's an mm -hmm. honor to be married to him. And I, I take zero credit, zero, zero, zero. Honestly, I went to God in that moment, and that was part of that reshape, and that, that was the result. Huh. As I mentioned earlier, or alluded to, um, you have not been untouched by tragedy in you and Alejandro. In, in 2015, yeah. and you devote an entire chapter in the book to this, um, the reshape mm -hmm. through pain. You and Alejandro received a call that your father-in-law, Alejandro's dad and his brother, were kidnapped near their hometown in Mexico, and sadly, they were both killed. And you write in the book, the grief and the pain felt like we were carrying a building on our shoulders. It was the greatest weight I ever experienced, pulling me down all the time. Losing them changed everything. I was not the same person. In tragedy, faith is truly put to the test. Honestly, that was the most difficult thing in all of this for me. Suffering had sent me to my knees in prayer so many times, and now it was hard to pray. I initially felt betrayed by God. I tried and tried, but I could not understand. Uh, and you go on to, st to mention how Jesus said from the cross, why have you forsaken me? Um, uh, how did you and Alejandro deal with this horrible tragedy? And, and talk to me you a know, little bit about how fa your faith was challenged and how you overcame that. You know, during that time, it's so hard, like to, you know, you're in that space and I'm hearing it again. And during that time, like to lose one person in that way is inconceivable. Mm -hmm. But to lose two, you have no idea how to even mourn. Like it, it, you, as a human being to process that is really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. And we were really struggling. And my father-in-law was such a devout man. It's so beautiful. Honestly, when they took him, I thought they would fall in love with him and they were going they would return him. Like I, I didn't think it was going to end the way it did. So when we lost him, um, we were confused. We were angry with God because he took a good one. And um, we, we, we met with many priests, many spiritual advisors. I mean, we did so much work on ourselves just try to understand. And it's so funny. I was hosting a Catholic conference and Alejandro wasn't even open to even sit in the audience. He stayed up in the room. He was with me. And Father Michael mm. Gately got up and he was talking about his book, 33 Days to Morning Glory. And he was talking about Mary and the son and bringing us back to Jesus and union. And I don't know what happened in that moment. Again, I have chills. I knew that I needed Alejandro to talk to her talk to Father Michael Gately. And I was thinking, Mary is the way. I've never had a devotion to Mary. Like, I really didn't. I would just go straight to the big man. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I brought them together. He shared with us the book. We started doing the book, 33 Days to Morning Glory. And honestly, Mary felt like 
a safe choice for us because we it was too sensitive what we were feeling to go directly to God. Like we just couldn't. So Mary, mm -hmm. through that devotion, gently guided us back into union with her son. And that's when the healing mm -hmm. began. And that's when the healing began after that, after doing that devotion. And now I feel mm -hmm. like because of that tragedy, we really have changed the way we walk through this, this world. I mean, I, I, we definitely make different choices. We really try to be super present and in the moment, knowing that life is so short and could be taken away in an instant. Um, mm. We really try daily to surrender uh, our lives into God's will. You know, being in this entertainment business, it seems all it seems very glamorous, but there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to finances and jobs, and sometimes jobs in, uh, are few and far between. And you know, you're always sort of it's all it's always that balance. Right. So, um, really putting our faith in God, and He's always delivered. He really has. It's it's, it's amazing. Mm. No, it's a great part of the book and, and, you know, worth reading. I think the, the journey is worth it for that chapter, though there are other commendable chapters, too. But uh, at the beginning of the first chapter, you use one of my favorite quotes from St. Catherine of Siena. Be who God meant you to be and you will set the world on fire. What do you want yeah. readers to take, Ali, from um, Reshape Your Life? And what's the message that you want them to hold dearest as they, as they go through this? I mean, when you say that quote, I love it so much because often I feel like as we get older, we lose that fire, right? Those things that bring us ultimate joy because we get older and life starts to happen and we focus on the bills and the jobs and the kids and everything. But we have mm -hmm. to remember those things that set our souls on fire, right? In my husband's movie, um, there's a quote there that says, you can either serve your passion or you can serve your weakness, not both. So I truly believe in serving the passion, right? And, and really that is, that pretty much describes everything that the book is about. Like really, you know, not settling for a half life. Like we have one life, one life. And I just want us all to really try our best to make it a masterpiece. I love it. Ali Landry, thank you for being here. And by the way, your husband's movie, uh, uh, the you. Mother Cabrini film, is incredible. Which you know, I've seen, I've seen bits and pieces of it, not the entire film, oh but what I've gosh. seen is, is pretty stellar. Um, reshape oh, your life. Don't you. settle because you are worth it. By Ali Landry is available now at bookstores everywhere and online. Ali, hope you'll come back sometime soon and come visit us in New Orleans. I would love it. Thank you so much. Thank you. That is all the time we have for now. Be sure to catch us next week. Until then, we'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, thank you for watching. I'm Raymond Arroyo. Bye now.